Hello ladies and gentlemen, it's Mike here at Game From Scratch and for a few weeks now we've had the new version of Godot 3.1 and naturally that means it's time to start looking towards the future. Now we looked at Godot 4.0 which is quite a ways off, that's the one with the new underlying Vulkan renderer, new physics support and so on. That is going to be a year or more away. Godot 4.0 is quite a ways off but Godot 3.2 is the next version and more and more information is coming out about what is actually going to be in that version. Now what you see in front of you is game from scratch. I put together uh, all of the stuff I have found so far, both between blog posts and then tweets. And that's what we're going to do. We're going to look today at the officially announced features that are coming in Godot 3.2. So we should start seeing them in nightly builds or in beta releases, hopefully coming soon. I have no idea what the actual timeline is here, but this is the stuff that is going to be theoretically in the next version of Godot 3.2, assuming nothing goes wrong. So without further ado, let us jump in and take a look at what those features are. Starting off with the stuff on the Godot website. So let's do it. First off, we have Godot is getting uh, pseudo 3D support in the 2D engine. Now you've always been able to do 3D, uh, 2D in 3D. So basically you just work in 3D, set 2D as a, you know, a perspective camera or an orthogonal camera, stick with the uh, thing and basically just pretend there's no z-axis. And that's one way of doing 3D, but that also makes it more complicated. And sometimes you just want a 3D-esque effect. And that's what pseudo 3D is going to give you. A pseudo is basically semi or fake. Um, and what it's going to do is it's going to hook into the canvas layer. Now the canvas layer node is designed for doing things like overlays that stay static. Things like, you know, the life bar, your HUD, your controls, that kind of stuff. Uh, but now what they're doing is adding a follow viewport tag to the canvas layers. Now what that's going to allow you to do is have the canvas layers move with the scene. And then there's another setting there called scale, which is actually going to allow it to, to move at a slightly different rate, giving you a pseudo 3D effect. This is already being used today in the uh, parallax kind of support, but this is much more in the foreground. So you can get uh, certain 3D, pseudo 3D looking effects uh, using the 2D editor uh, without having to go into full 3D. There's also a preview uh, without running the game. So you can go so previewing the effect of the editor is very easy. Just use the new preview canvas scale and you're going to see your new pseudo 3D effects in your 2D game. Definitely a niche one, uh, but I can see where certain games would really take advantage of it. Uh, next up, we have Godot 3.2 will allow disabling of editor features. Now, I, I get the use case here. I just think it's this feature might be a little... I'm not sure about this one, to be honest. So what it allows you to do is turn off, enable and disable certain features within the editor. So you see there's going to be this manage editor features, and then you come in here and turn off things that you don't want. So if you don't want the import functionality or, or the scripting in there or the 3D editor, you can just turn them off. You can also just turn off access to classes. Now, I can see where you could work and say you had... Um, you know, an artist. And, and these are the two, the two details they give, education, companies, and then down here. So basically in education, you could have it where if you're just, um, you know, you wanted to teach people kind of relatively, you could turn off functionality that wasn't there. I actually think that would be more confusing and it never be, would be a route I would go personally. And then in terms of in a company, you could have it so like if you had, you know, you artists, you didn't want them having access to the scripts, you could turn off the scripting. Uh, or if you didn't want your um, programmers to uh, re-import stuff, you could turn off the importing. And that's kind of the thought behind it. I just honestly think this leads to more problems than it's worth, but I'd love to hear your opinion down below. Is this functionality you would take advantage of or do you think it's kind of just needless complication. Uh, next up we have, and this one's very nice, add support for convex decomposition. Now this one sounds scary, but it really isn't. One of the things you have is a lot of times when you've got uh, non-trivial meshes, uh, you're going to need to create a bounding volume for them. This is a collision mesh. It's a lot simpler than the underlying mesh, but it, it envelops the model so that your collision calculations are accurate-ish, but not as many polygons as the base mesh. Otherwise, what's the point behind creating them? So here you can see with super Susan from Blender, the default monkey head icon, uh, it's been turned into a sphere, two um, cylinders or two um, capsules, and a box. So again, a whole lot less polygons used to define the, the rough shape of this one for a collision mesh, but it's definitely a polygon saving, so your collision engine isn't going to get whomped trying to check for collision between shapes. However, it's still not incredibly accurate, and you still had to manually do this work yourself. You had to, to, to make this, this 
composition for you. So now what you can do is actually create a convex collision sibling uh, via convex decomposition. The algorithm is VHACD. Click there for more details on it. And then what you see is it's basically creating that volume for you. You know, you could do this on import when you bring your mesh in and you could have it automatically create these, uh, kind of think of it as a, like a low polygon shrink wrap over your object. So this should actually make a whole lot easier to add collisions to any convex shape and make your work a whole lot less while making your physics quite a bit better. So this is definitely a win-win-win feature across the board. And it's implemented as part of the input process. Uh, existing hints will generate convex shapes via, via decomposition instead of the old quick call approach. Um, this will finally allow creating ridge bodies directly in the 3D scene. So that's definitely nice. Um, next up, we have Godot is getting new audio features, and these are actually pretty simple, but pretty sweet. So we got two new features here. We have audio generators, which can basically spit out a stream. The cool thing here is once this object is obtained, push stereo audio frames to it. Think about this as you basically composing the waveform dynamically or programmatically directly in the game. So if you want a programmatic, programmatic access to create sound effects or modify sound effects on the fly, in the Godot engine, audio generators are going to give you that functionality. Now, on top of that, there's also a new spectrum analyzer. This is added as part of the audio bus and enables you to get a whole lot more detail uh, on things like uh, the magnitude of uh, the currently playing value. It returns a normalized value in linear scale. Use linear two decibels to help convert to decibels if needed. But what it allows you to do is have raw access to the currently playing sound effects. Again, giving you a whole lot more programmatic control over audio. Basically, you can create audio and you can monitor audio in real time with these two changes. Next up, we have texture atlases. Now, texture atlases were actually in Godot 2. Point something. Uh, they were removed in 3, I believe it was. Um, and now they're kind of basically being brought back. Now, if you don't know what a texture atlas is, basically you take a bunch of sprites and you put them all together into a larger sprite. The reason behind this is drawing a sprite, um, loading a sprite into texture memory is actually a somewhat expensive operation. So if you have a character, so for example here, this character, there's four uh, and then another five and then another three. Uh, so what is that, 12? 12 sprites there. If you loaded 12 different, draw, if they were all their own little individual textures, that'd be 12 different texture bind draw calls to get it. And then each time you drew one, there'd be overhead there. So instead what you do is you put them all together into one common image or an atlas. And then um, you just say, okay, I, I want this piece when you draw it. So it turns it from 12, 12 binds and 12 loads into one load and then uses fast operations to access them. It's a very common technique in 2D game development in general. Uh, it gives you the ability to do things like optimized memory. So instead of being in a grid like this, you can have them tightly packed in as, as strongly as an algorithm allows you to do. So this functionality is coming back. Here is the process of using one. Basically add a bunch of images to your game, select them, and then say change to a texture atlas, uh, set the atlas file name, and then click re-import. And then it will do all of its calculations for turning all of those different images into a single tightly backed, packed image. And you've got options for how to do it. You basically either do regions or mesh 2D. The mesh 2D will cut a polygon around the used parts and pack it, allowing you to be really, really tight. The downside is drawing is less flexible. Uh, it's not possible to batch meshes either. So this is only really useful for when you're really tight on memory or when you've got a lot of control over the kind of images you're dealing with up front. And finally, we are getting a new Android plugin system. Basically, Android system right now, if you add plugin support, so if you add um, an extension to Android for, say, add mob support, you currently have to do a rebuild. Now that is no longer required. Now, what's even cooler about this, though, so if you add support for, um, and here's kind of a step by step process, and there's a tutorial here on how to actually go ahead and create the extension. You still got to use the Java SDK and the Android SDK and all that to get things up and going. There is documentation on. It, but the really cool part is um, once it's created, as they are just extra files that are added to the project, it's now very easy to distribute them via the asset library. So for example, if I set up AdMob plugin for uh, you know doing ads in Android, I can then share that to the asset library and any other Android developer can then now use or consume those plugins just from the asset library. So it makes adding Android plugins a whole heck of a lot easier, which is definitely nice to see. Okay, so that is it for the top line major features that they have gone into details about. So now let's get into, and these are getting really blurry because I'm zoomed quite a ways in. Let's get into some of the tweets that have gone on. So the first one is they're doing a relook of the um, signal wiring up 
um, process. And right now it is a little clunky, so it'll be nice to see a friendlier one coming in 3.2. Uh, Bastian Olage, I probably brutalized that Bastian, and I apologize. He's the guy that has been doing the AR and VR stuff. Uh, looks like AR kit drivers for Godot are coming into 3.2, so we're going to have functional AR kit drivers theoretically, which is nice to see. AR kit or augmented reality is what allows you to um, basically mix real world data such as captured from your camera with say 3D generated polygons that are generated by your game. It allows you to do things like Pokemon Go. So basically when anyone says, what's AR? You say it's Pokemon Go. Uh, next up we have... Um, this one is 3.2, add the ability to clip images to a polygon outline so packing them can be even more efficient. I think that might be mixing in with the Atlas stuff we just talked about. This one is from Lupo, uh, and it's just mentioned here. I don't know that this is a major feature elsewhere, but you will be able to export game profile data as CSV in Godot 3. Contributing to Godot is very easy. Uh, da, 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 da. Um, and then what's not happening is sprite batching for 2D is not in 3.2. It is part of the 4.0 release. And that's kind of one of the downsides here. I think personally, the number one biggest thing that uh, Godot needs is performance improvements at this point in time. It needs faster sprite rendering and faster 3D. And unfortunately, those are all pending on the renderer coming in Godot 4, which I kind of wish that that was actually the priority, but that is also a pretty big underlying and gut killing. So it's really kind of um, an, an intrinsic part of the engine. So I can understand why it's going to take a while, but a lot of the performance related stuff that's going to just in general improve the performance of Godot are unfortunately down the road at Godot 4.1. Anyways, that is it. That is what to expect in Godot 3.2. Hopefully at least a few of you found that useful and I will talk to you all later. Goodbye.